It seems like such a drastic thing to lose a limb, but it's actually not a major compared to so many other injuries you can have. Life just throws you curveballs all the time, but they're just challenges. They're just things to accomplish. This is where you know, my life was changed forever. I have a pretty vivid memory of the whole thing. It's not a sad place, really. It's the start of a new chapter in my life, and obviously it was a pretty brutal start to the chapter. Okie dokie. <laughs> I'm Mitch Joint, I'm a para-athlete, and I work 50 hours as a truck driver. I start at four, end at two, and then straight to training after that. So to balance the work and training life, I genuinely just kind of cut out sleep. Here you go, my dear. <laughs> so I'm a below knee amputee. I lost it in a workplace accident about 10 years ago. Mitch is a typical Kiwi bloke. Uh, Very no emotions, get things done, hard worker. What, what are your shifts this week? <laughs> I have three twelves. Now he's into running. When he first started, he would have got a participation award, but now that he's put in all this effort, changed his lifestyle. Trains six days a week. He's made huge leaps and bounds. So as an athlete, you're always meant to have goals and they're meant to be realistic. I want to be a Paralympian. I want to go to a world champs or any major event, really, and I want to make the final. And I want to consistently make the final. And I want to be an athlete that other athletes recognise on the start sheet. They'll see me on the start sheet and be like, oh, I've got to beat him or I've got to race him. He's going to be a tough challenge. Before the accident, I was not that driven. I was sort of just going through the motions of life. I sort of took two legs for granted. So thinking back 10 years, I've nearly spent as long without a leg as with a leg now. I hardly even really remember what two-legged life is. So this is it. This is where it all happened. There was an arborist at the time. I haven't been back here for probably five or six years now, and I don't know, it's a little bit eerie, but it's, it's kind of unbelievable how it hasn't changed at all. It sort of bring, it does kind of bring the memories back a little bit. The day of the accident was a Friday. It was the end of the day, so I guess a little bit tired. We were pruning these macacarpas away from the power lines. I was the groundie that day, and it was the final cleanup. So I threw a stub of wood into the chipper, and it bounced off the rollers that usually would drag wood in. So then I used my foot to just sort of kick it back in, almost out of a reflex. But we're on a gravel road, so as I kicked, my other foot slid, and then the rollers grabbed my foot. So it dragged me in, and there was not really anything I could do about it. And then Stop Go had to come over and turn the machine off. While I was in the chip, I kind of didn't know the damage. Because the blades are actually quite a bit further behind the grip. It was sort of like a mystery box before then, like, have I lost a toe or have I lost the whole leg? They then had to turn it back on. And the arborist had to come and sort of start it up again to reverse me back out of it. 
once I was out, I'm not actually very good with blood, so I sort of had one look and was like, well, we, you know, we can't have, we can't do that. The pain, as soon as it happened, it was probably 15 out of 10. And then the adrenaline kind of kicks in and numbs it. And then it would just go f kind of from excruciating to sort of numb and just back and forth. Pretty much the whole time I was laying here, I remember just wanting to sort of just nod off and like then it can, I'd, be, I'd wake up in hospital and it'll be either a bad dream or it'll be over from there. But because you go into shock, you might not actually wake up from that sleep, so they obviously can't let me do that. I was here on the side of the road for about 90 minutes to two hours. Um, initially, the Westpac chopper was called, but um, they got diverted to a crash, so then they had to call the Northland chopper. I got airlifted to Wangare Hospital. I actually got a phone call from his mum and she'd said, I've got five minutes of courage to call you. Mitch has been in an accident. She said, all she said was his foot was in a chipper. I don't know anything more, his phone's dead. Sort of hung up the phone, burst into tears, went and told my parents, had no idea the severity of what that meant. It chipped just behind the heel and then sort of all of the foot part. My ankle was powdered, so even if they gave me a prosthetic just for the foot, I was then going to have to go through rehab of a broken ankle. And they said the recovery was just possible, but it was going to be harder and longer and not guaranteed to be successful. Whereas if you just amputate halfway up the calf, it'll, you'll just be like pretty much normal. So in that morning, I was like, sweet, you're the boss. Like, let's go, let's do it. Like, it's, it's not coming back, so we may as well just like start the process. With him being okay, it made it easier, but it was a huge thing to have to get through. Never thought it would happen. You know, it's always one of those, those things that happen to someone else and not you. It was difficult for me being in the moment. I had to go through the sort of the pain and then the thought of rehab and all that, but for my friends and family and everyone that I care about, they were just on the sideline, just had to, to watch it and, and sit back and, you know, do the best they could mentally. They couldn't really physically help me. So I, I think that was probably harder than what I had to go through. Okay. Here, that's right. There, one in front of the other, that's right. Rehab was difficult, but probably not as hard as you sort of imagine. It's harder mentally than physically because as humans, we're so good at adapting anyway. Relearning how to walk or relearning how to run or do anything is kind of natural. So this one's actually, it's sort of a timeline of my recovery. So this is the first date, this is the day that it happened, the 16th of 12th, 2013. And then the second date is the date that I first got my prosthetic. So in all, it's only like five months, which, Pretty impressive, like there's a pretty quick turnaround from having two legs to having one leg to being back to living life pretty much like you had two legs. Once you've gotten through the hard parts of the rehab, the phantom pains, the genuine just pain of a surgery, he just took it and ran with it, literally. <laughs> As soon as I had my accident, I was pretty confident that I wanted to get into some sort of para sport. It just gave me something to focus on, and it gives you more of a motivation to live life to its fullest. And wearing the black singlet is top tier, like you've made it. And so that's what I want to get to. I want to be a Paralympian. Today, where you're doing straight into max velocity. I think I had the typical Kiwi kid, I'd love to be an all black. Not really realistically though. I never put any effort into high performance sport or becoming the best at anything. I think that was sort of the mindset I was at. I was never gonna make an Olympic team, but I could make a Paralympic team. From then on, I was like, I'm doing sport because I love doing sport, but I'm doing sport because I 
want to be a Paralympian. The first time I put on my blade, it just remember feeling so much freer. The sensation is um, it's just like a spring. Like it, um, it just gives so much more back to try and uh, recreate what an ankle would give you. Running with the blade wasn't that difficult to get used to just because I'd already started running on my day leg. That was hard, like that was really difficult because it doesn't have any flexion in the ankle. All the pressure pretty much is on the very bottom of the stump. There's very little protection on it. It's pretty much just bone and then a little bit of meaty stuff and then skin. So when you're, you know, pounding the pavement on that, there's a pretty big risk of it, the bones just sort of coming through. I did a half marathon. Once I took it off at the end, it was just blood and sweat. But I was <laughs> worth it. I think it was just always about that. Just doing things because I could and maybe people thought I couldn't. There's definitely a learning curve to running on it, Blade, to begin with. I have tripped over a few times just learning where the toes are because they're not exactly where um, they are on my foot. Where the tip of the blade is, it more lines up with your forefoot rather than your toes. So sometimes just getting the toes, you know, far enough over, um, you just forget. <laughs> I don't have any natural talent in, like, sport. I'm not a naturally gifted runner. I'm not naturally good at anything. But I am willing to work harder than anyone else in the room. I'm not going to pick it up and be the best in the first week, but I'll be the best by the end of the season. All right, you three all ready? Two teams, two twenties. First impressions were probably a little less than glowing. Easy. He came along, he was wearing like his work clothes, he was a bit out of shape, didn't really say too much, and just he didn't give the impression of being a guy who was going to be like a fantastic sprinter. Um, so I was like, I was pretty sceptical actually, and he was just about to run a marathon, like he was weeks away from doing his first marathon. I was like, this guy's crazy. But he slowly but surely kind of won me over and turned that initial opinion around. Set. Even his body type, like he was kind of a naturally soft, pudgy guy. Now he looks like he's carved of granite. Bigger step, bigger, bigger movements, tight tummy, flat back. Even technically, like what the key positions are in sprinting, that took a lot of work. I've got here off my own steam. Obviously, I have a support network and people around me that help me get there, but like financially, I don't have any help. You don't get any funding in this country unless you're a medalist, essentially. Nothing's for free. So a day in the life of Mitch is wake up at four and when I'm pudgy, I then have to go for a, a bike ride in the morning. And then I go to work at 4.30. AM. I work as a truck driver, drive down to East Tamaki, load up, and then deliver all the way north. I have to load up again at Port Marsden, and then come home. I actually don't mind the mornings. I just kind of figured getting up at seven kind of sucks as much as getting up at four. It's just now I have three extra hours in the day. As far as driving goes with a prosthesis, instead of being able to use my ankle to control the speed, I just have to use sort of my knee and hip. So I just lift the whole thing up or drop the whole thing accordingly. I still feel the accelerator. I just feel it up in my knee rather than in my foot and ankle. I drive trucks for a living because I've got to put a roof over my head, I've got a mortgage to pay, bills to pay bucks, the dreams representing New Zealand, that just doesn't pay that well. So I'm willing to, you know, get up at 4 a.m. And, and put in all these hard hours so that I can then go to training early in the afternoon with an actual coach, um, you know, to chase the actual dream, which is, yeah, the Paralympics. Still a work in progress. He did get pretty good the 18-month mark. He qualified for world champs. 
than going to World Champs. You know, he kind of really pulled one out of the box. He made the final, ran the Oceania record, Paralympic Games qualifying time, but that's another story. Tokyo Paralympics in the non-selection was probably the hardest thing I've gone through in my life, including rehab, because I had the times I was fast enough to go. I just didn't get selected. And so it spurred me on for Oceanias, which is coming up. I want to get medals just to prove to them that they made a mistake. Anything is achievable and like if I'm passionate about something, it is getting done one way or the other. If you had asked me a year ago, I probably would have been happy to have just gone to Tokyo, become a Paralympian, and then maybe have sort of re-evaluated. But I obviously didn't make it to Tokyo, so then immediately it shifted to, well, I have to go to Paris then. But there's steps to that. Like Oceanias, which is coming up, I want to go there and I want to run exceptionally. Any chance to wear a silver fern, he gets really excited, but the pressure's definitely there. With that miss that he got from Tokyo, I feel like he's just gonna keep trying until he gets there. Which is good, I think he performs better under pressure. This was a really good season for me. I ran better than I've ever run before, and I did that in New Zealand conditions, which aren't really made for sprinting. So once I go over to Queensland, where it's going to be hotter, a faster track, I'm aiming for a gold in the 200 and podium in the 400. Going off my times, and if I run my best, those are easily achievable. Race day is my least favourite part of the whole sport. I like competing against myself. I like being better than past Mitch. I don't really mind winning or losing against anyone else. I just want to be better than me. So I could do the same thing solo and get just the same amount of endorphins out of it. I really like the training, I like the grind, and I like after the race, but I could do without this bit. You know, you got to do this part for the sport to make sense. <laughs> I think all runners have some superstitions. I don't have that many, but I do have one. So, granddad's initials. They got it stitched onto all of my other singlets. My granddad actually passed away a month before my first ever race. And he was always there for sporting events as a kid. He'd always come to rugby games or soccer games. So I know in this sport, he would have done the same. He would have come to as many races as he possibly could. But yeah, it's just nice to have him there in spirit. The way in the men's para ambulatory 400 metres championship with the inside Hinksman, Man, Hendy, Turner, and Joint. Reminder across these five athletes, we have four different categories. And as they come into the straight, it's Riley Mann leading. Turner, Hendy, Joint, and Hintman. And so now those times will be put into the NDS tables and we'll do the presentations shortly. Cannot believe how badly that went. If I'd run this time in one gold, I'd be just as mad. Oh, I'm, yeah, ropeable. That was an embarrassment. That was, yeah. Uh, words can't describe the uh, sort of how mad I am at that. If I'd run well, I probably would have celebrated for like, I don't know, a day or two. But this, I'm going to remember this for ever. Like I'm going to every every time I ever think of like a bad race, I'm going to remember this this bad race. Every time he does a race, even unless it's a personal best, he'll come away. Oh, that wasn't very good. Even if it was an amazing race, because that's just the way he is. He's in a really competitive classification. There's just a lot of guys who either through birth defect or, or accidents end up losing a limb. And a lot of those guys were already great athletes before they became para-athletes. But 
We know we can do the work to get there. We just need a, a, a little bit of luck along the way. One of my sayings is that hard work beats talent when talent doesn't want to work hard. I'm just willing to work harder than anyone else in any room to become the best, whereas there's other people that are just naturally gifted and aren't willing to put the work in, so they're only going to get to a certain level, and I, I'll overtake them because I'm willing to work harder than they are. Now have our second time final in the men's para-ambulatory 200 metres championship. In five from New Zealand, Mitch Joint. In six from regional Australia, Leighton Lloyd. They're away in the second of the two time finals in the men's para-ambulatory 200 metres. Inside Wyatt, Netting, Joint, Lloyd, Woolley and Johnson. Again, a number of different categories. So these times will be compared in the MDS tables to the first race. Mitch Joint coming down strongly in the middle. He'll cross the line first. Happy with that one. Um, I felt like I gave as much as I could. Uh, maybe it wasn't my best performance just because I've been tired from competing for two days, but I reckon I left it all out there, so I'm, I'm happier than I was yesterday. Representing New Zealand, Mitch Joint. Come on, Mitch. Good job, Mitch. First place gold medalist and Oceania champion. If I had a time machine, obviously I would probably like to have two legs, but the guy that had two legs didn't have this mindset. I think the accident made that mindset for me. I think before I was always willing to sort of commit to something, but then after the accident it just went tenfold and it became almost not an option to not commit to something. Okay. Round this one. Oscar, sit. Oh, immensely proud. Couldn't be more proud. He's the most dedicated person I've ever met, probably. I think he'll just keep going until he gets what he wants. I think it's made me like me more. And then this sort of made me realise I could probably take life by the scruff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.